Okay. Are we ready Hello. to get started? Hello, everyone. Um, can we get our first slide up there? Welcome to our first webinar of our first webinar series from the National Wraparound Initiative. Uh, I'm Janet Walker, and I'm here with Eric Bruns. We are the co-directors of the National Wraparound Initiative. Hello, everyone. This is Eric. I am uh, here on this webinar from my office in Seattle, Washington. Welcome to 112 folks on our attendee list who are listening in. Okay, so just a few things before we get started about the webinar. Uh, if you are uh, familiar with webinars, um, maybe you've heard all of this before, but um, there can be interference from uh, cell phones and other electronic devices, so uh, keep those away. Um, if you're having problems, you might want to get rid of uh, streaming music video file sharing. Um, if you're having audio problems, obviously you can see there, check the settings in the audio pane up to the right. Um, you can send questions to us using the question uh, application there. Uh, during the uh, session, we're probably not going to stop and answer questions until the end. Uh, additionally, we're going to keep people muted until the end, again, just to avoid all that extraneous noise that can happen with a lot of people on the phone. We will enable the raise your hand option during question and answer at the end, so you can uh, we can unmute you and you can ask a question. We'll, we'll let you know when we're, um, when we're unmuting you. Um, and if you are calling in, you have to have your audio pin enabled so that we can unmute you to let you talk at that point. We will be making this available and PowerPoint, uh, making the webinar and PowerPoint available on the NWI website so everybody can have all the slides. We, we're going to be um, covering a lot of information today and we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to follow up with the resources that we're going to be describing to you. So we, uh, when everybody registered for the webinar, we asked you to talk a little bit about what your goals were for the meeting. And consistent with the topic of the webinar, which was, you know, was sort of an introduction, an overview to wraparound, people were saying things like they wanted an overview, they wanted to understand the basics, a little bit understand about what a uh, high fidelity wraparound is, etc. So we have pretty much pitched this to an overview um, and a kind of an introductory level for the webinar. What we also have done is we include um, this, uh, the uh, ability for you, we direct you to further resources because we know it's a lot of information to take in. So for um, for many of the slides, you'll see at the bottom a link to web-based resource. Most of this is resources from the National Wraparound Initiative website, and specifically the resource guide, which contains articles uh, that give quite a bit more information about each of these topics. So we'll be directing you to those specific uh, resources as we go along. Yeah, and going to the next slide, just a really quick overview of what we are going to attempt to cover today in about an hour, followed by uh, uh, half an hour of question and answer. We are going to attempt to provide in this session an overview of wraparound. This is a very high-level overview, and as Janet said, there's no way you can provide all the details in an hour, or probably even in a week. So one thing that the National Wraparound Initiative uh, has partnered with the Technical Assistance Partnership for Children's Mental Health, uh, to do is to bring a series of webinars every month, and you will see it. You can find the schedule, uh, the full schedule, probably from the same source that you signed up for this webinar. Um, and we'll go into more depth about several of the um, things that we're going to touch on today. But we're going to provide an overview. We're going to pre present this basic understanding of wraparound and its purpose and its principles. A very little, very brief overview of the practice model of wraparound as members of the National Wraparound Initiative have defined it. Uh, Janet's going to go through um, the theory of change for wraparound that explains where the research is about why this model is proposed to get us better outcomes for children, youth, and families. Um, fifth, we're going to outline, again, very briefly, the types of community-level conditions that need to be in place to support wraparound. And finally, uh, because folks are very interested in this, a basic summary of the research on wraparound. Um, one last thing to say about um, our webinar today and the series of webinars is we'd like to thank the uh, Child, Adolescent, and Family Branch of SAMHSA as well as the TA Partnership uh, for Children's Mental Health, which you can find online, many of you probably already have, at tapartnership.org for their support to um, the NWI to uh, 
bring this information to folks. One other acknowledgement is, is that the National Wraparound Initiative, we'll talk a little bit about what the NWI is. We would love to have folks uh, who are on this uh, webinar be involved in the NWI. All of the materials that we describe here today are based on the hard work of literally hundreds of people across the country who have contributed um, their understanding of wraparound, their own programs and initiatives experiences to the resource guide to wraparound. We want to acknowledge that the NWI and wraparound itself is really something that's very grassroots and communitarian, um, which is a little bit different than a lot of models out there that are more um, proprietary um, and based on um, a small number of developers. Uh, we're drawing from all this collective experience as we um, present this information today. On the, on the screen now, you see a little bit more about the National Wraparound Initiative. Uh, Janet, are you going to go into a little bit of that? Well, uh, very briefly, again, this is something that we have more information about on the web in the resource guide. And, and it's just that, um, you know, the, wraparound, the National Wraparound Initiative only got going in 2004. And the effort was to more clearly define wraparound practice and um, to help to support better practice. And it was originally a fairly small group of people who were um, invited because of their high levels of expertise. And then it's gradually expanded. And we'll uh, be talking a little bit more about our next phase of expansion towards the end of, of the webinar. And, and we'll be talking and letting you know about ways that you can become involved in the National Wraparound Initiative. OK, next. Very good. So one other resource, in addition to uh, the National Wraparound Initiative website, on which you're going to find a lot of material, um, one place to go for uh, information across several different aspects of wraparound implementation is the URL www.rapinfo.org. We're going to talk a little bit about one of the uh, goals of the National Wraparound Initiative, which was to allow for better uh, accountability and measurement of implementation quality of wraparound. We realize there's no one way to measure implementation of wraparound. However, one of the inspirations for um, launching the National Wraparound Initiative and bring the experts together to define what the core principles and activities of the practice model for wraparound uh, team effort um, was to be able to create some measures of wraparound implementation. So just one other thing to start out with is, is that if you do, in fact, go to wrapinfo.org, you'll find uh, links to the resource guide to Wraparound, to the National uh, Wraparound Initiative website, and also to the uh, Wraparound Fidelity Assessment System. We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit later on, about how to measure um, fidelity and quality of Wraparound. Um, and there are four instruments that are part of the Wraparound Fidelity assist Assessment System that we're going to spend a little bit of time on later in this webinar. We're going to dedicate an entire webinar um, to this topic of measuring wraparound implementation and outcomes in June. Um, but just to let folks know, you can find a lot more information about the Wraparound Fidelity Assessment System that includes the WFI, Wraparound Fidelity Index Interviews, a team observation measure that we call the TOM, uh, the document review measure that's um, under revision right now, and a measure of community support for wraparound. And you can get this by going to wrapinfo.org and clicking on the appropriate link and the uh, more details on a chapter on fidelity measurement as well as the wraparound evaluation and research team are at the bottom of this slide, which you'll be able to find on our website after we're done. OK, so I'm going to start out just by talking a little bit about uh, the what and why of wraparound. So we just want to make sure that um, we're all kind of operating from the same basic elemental idea of what we're trying to achieve I think all of us are trying to achieve this who work with children and families. And this is, this is an orientation to our work that we like to make sure we start our presentations out with. That really, until proven otherwise, um, we believe that all parents want to be proud of their child. They want to have a positive influence on their child. All parents and caregivers, whoever's caring for a child, they want to hear good news about their child and what their child does well. They want to provide their child a good education and a good chance of success in life. They want to have a good relationship when they, with their child, and they want to believe they're good parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles, whoever that they're, whatever uh, young person they're caring for, regardless of how complex their needs are. Go on to the next slide there. Until proven otherwise, 
We also believe that all children and youth want to have their parents be proud of them. They want to be accepted as part of a group. They want to be active and involved in activities with others, learn new things, uh, make their opinions known, and make choices when given an opportunity. So moving forward here, you know, this wraparound is essentially, without we getting into any of the details of the principles or the phases and activities of implementing this team-based model, at a very basic level, wraparound is something that's attempting to ensure that all children and youth, regardless of how complex their needs are, and all families, regardless of how complex their needs are, can achieve that, the, their hopes and dreams and um, have those uh, elements that I just went over be as, as common a part of their existence as any other youth or family. Wraparound attempts to achieve that kind of vision for children and youth and actually individuals of an entire age range, though we're going to talk primarily about children and youth today. Um, by providing a family-driven, team-based process for planning and implementing services and supports that can, um, that, that, that can help children and youth with those kinds of complex, with, with the most complex needs in any system. Uh, summed up in one slide, through the wraparound process, uh, teams of individuals who are important to that child and family create plans that are geared towards meeting their unique and holistic needs. And wraparound team members that come together, which should include the, the identified youth, his or her parents or caregivers, other family members and community members, professionals, and anyone who is uh, important in the life of that child who will be um, important to that team process, they come together to meet regularly and implement and monitor the plan that is developed to ensure its success. That's wraparound in, in, in one, uh, one slide. Now, why is it that wraparound is something that's become such a common uh, component of so many systems of care? Well, just coming from a research perspective, which is what I do here at the University of Washington, is, is primarily conduct research. We know from you know, all sorts of data and research that's been uh, conducted that children and youth with serious emotional, behavioral, mental health conditions with complex needs, they have a, a high risk of, of poor outcomes. Um, poor outcomes like not getting through high school, um, not being able to find meaningful employment, um, even um, higher rates of, of criminal behavior. And, you know, for, for many years, one of the first responses to youth with serious emotional behavioral disorders was to um, either proactively or reactively um, find placements out of the community um, that might that were proposed to potentially be able to better meet their needs than being with their family and and in their in their home community. Research has kind of uh, indicated that out of home placements need to be used very carefully uh, because they're they're an extremely costly mechanism to try to meet the needs of these children and youth. And the research shows that they 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 often don't help improve the outcomes that we're looking to achieve. Um, they certainly are uh, not. They have not been found to be likely to facilitate a young person being able to ultimately live and thrive in their in their homes and communities. In fact, out of home placement is is typically the best predictor of future out of home placements. The wraparound, first and foremost, go on to the next slide. There is something that's intended to uh, support um, a young person and their family to uh, live and thrive in their homes and communities. But this is very difficult for systems to achieve. Um, intervening effectively with uh, young people with these kind of complex mental health needs has proven to be very difficult. Uh, folks who work in systems of care out there uh, know this from their own personal experience. There's a lot of reasons why it's difficult to achieve positive outcomes for these uh, young people. Here's just a few. So first of all, there are a lot of evidence-based practices out there, a lot of evidence-based treatments um, for individual disorders like anxiety disorders, um, even past trauma, depression, we're beginning to have a whole bunch of really um, uh, proven effective therapies for individual uh, mental health conditions. But when we're talking about young people with, um, with serious emotional behavioral problems, we're usually talking about child and family needs that are much more complex than a single, a single type of problem. So we have youth with serious mental Youth with serious conditions typically have multiple and overlapping problem areas that need attention. 
their families are also more likely to have unmet basic needs. Um, and ironically, these families and young people who perhaps have the most need for a coordinated response from our systems are the ones that might be the least likely to be fully engaged in services. Um, professionals tend to have um, relatively um, negative frames of mind about working with some of these youth and families. Um, we don't necessarily try very hard to engage the, full, you know, the whole family unit, um, extended families, uh, even parents and caregivers in the services that kids are receiving. So this leads to uh, treatment dropouts and missed opportunities to intervene. Um, research shows that 65% of uh, children who are engaged in uh, child and adolescent therapies drop out by the second session. So other reasons why uh, we are having a hard time achieving these uh, outcomes for young people, the systems that serve them are in silos. Special education, mental health, health care, uh, juvenile justice, they all have their own individual philosophy, structures, funding streams, uh, and mandates. And they don't work well together um, for individual families unless we come up with some sort of mechanism to bring them together. If we don't bring the systems together on behalf of the family who is involved in multiple of these systems, then often what happens is you get a lot of passing the, the responsibility from one system to another. And oftentimes you get very bad outcomes such as ultimately uh, just incredible frustration and loss of hope on the part of families who are often, you know, sometimes forced to relinquish custody to get help or children ultimately being placed out of home because the family members uh, give up uh, hope that there can be a, a coordinated uh, and clear response to their child's needs. Okay, and just a little aside here, we're going to be launching periodically through our webinar uh, small polls for you to answer. If you answer them within the next minute or two, then we'll be uh, showing the results later on. So they'll just appear in a small pane uh, within your, within your, on your screen. So I guess this, our first poll is, uh, we're, we're, we're trying this for the first time, folks, and um, it's going pretty well so far, we think, but this is a, a little slick uh, aspect of the webinar that we're able to do. Um, if you're interested in, in um, recording your vote on um, which of the following, in your opinion, might make Wraparound the most attractive to leaders in your community, go ahead and voice your opinion. And uh, this is just kind of a little exercise for engaging folks in, in the uh, content here. But we might also get some good information out of this. Yeah, we've got 72% voted, so we're giving you 10 more seconds to vote. And uh, then, uh, do we want to do the results right away, or? Um, sure, why not? Okay, let's see. We got share results. Here we go. So these are the findings that save money. Not surprisingly, seems to be the reason that most people. Um, most systems or most uh, stakeholders might be persuaded that wraparound is a good idea, followed shortly by improving outcomes, which are both areas obviously people consistently asking us about information about how much does it cost and what's the benefit. So um, that's, that's not, I guess, unexpected. Yeah, and save money actually randomly happened to be the one that came up in green. So <laughs> yeah. how our webinar technology knows, knows how to color code our responses. Okay, uh, now we can move ahead. That was pretty cool. Yep. Okay. So um, is this still me? Yeah, I guess yep. it is. Mm -hmm. So just really quick, you know, in the 1980s, um, there were some really radical ideas going around. You know, this is before I got into involved in children, uh, child, children serving systems personally. Um, personally, I started working in a uh, group home for young people in the early 90s, and I heard about wraparound and systems of care. I mean, in, in the late 70s, no one was calling it wraparound. In the 1980s, wraparound first emerged as a term. And back then, it really was uh, something that was being uh, done in a few places across uh, North America. Um, it was really a grassroots practice level response to those shortcomings of the existing systems that I described. Back then, there wasn't any sort of big fancy manuals or PowerPoints or fidelity measures. It was really just 
folks doing whatever it takes to bring children and, and, and uh, youth home to live in their own homes and communities and try and keep them at home if they, weren't, if they were in danger of being placed out of home. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, Bob Friedman and Beth Stroll wrote the uh, Systems of Care monograph um, and the Child and Adolescent Service System project started. Systems of Care were or emerging as an organizing framework to overcome these problems. So the bottom line here is for folks who are just looking for the 30-second description of wraparound and how it relates to systems of care, wraparound is a team-based practice model, um, and systems of care is a way to, to conceive of and organize systems. So they complement each other and share many of the same values. Wraparound is sometimes referred to as the most direct practice-level expression of systems of care. And if you want some additional resources on this, you can see um, the, uh, a chapter in our resource guide on the history of wraparound by John Vandenberg, one of the early pioneers of wraparound. And also be sure to check out, if you haven't already, the Systems of Care uh, website by SAMHSA and, of course, the TA Partnership website that is all about um, providing support to system of care communities. Those URLs at the bottom of that slide there. So as, as uh, wraparound slowly became something that was being attempted by more and more folks and articles were written about its promise and how it works, it started to become um, defined better for folks, typically in terms of being a value-driven philosophy, um, a way of working with families that was collaborative and brought teams together in a way um, that was intended to ensure that services and supports were family-driven and youth-guided, that they were culturally competent. The idea that uh, families were viewed in terms of their strengths and not their diagnoses or deficits. This is radical stuff. And of course, being community-based, um, you know, these were the primary um, shortcomings in the system that people were observing in the 1980s. And thus, they were the primary things that Wraparound was attempting to overcome. Overcome youth being placed out of home, overcome families being seen as the problem and not the solution and overcoming the idea that you just fit folks into some sort of service without asking how do we individualize a plan of care um, to mobilize this family's uh, natural and community supports to meet their needs. It was a philosophy uh, back in those days. But the, the, the beginnings of the uh, d definition of what wraparound was were, were uh, taking hold. So essentially to summarize kind of why, what's the overall, what's the feeling, what's the basis of wraparound being really different from other things? And we're going to go more again into the, the principles one by one and into the practice a little bit. But the, essentially, the essential grounding uh, element of wraparound is that it's driven by and owned by the family and youth. It's their perspectives in collaboration with the perspectives of the providers on the team, and this is a team of people, but it's the, it's the youth and family perspectives that are really driving the identification of what are the most important needs and what are the strategies, the service and su support strategies that are most likely to actually be helpful. So that's kind of the bottom line of wraparound. Um, and then again, that it's a team approach that's very collaborative. And this is one of the, I think, probably most difficult or the crux of providing wraparound is how to prioritize the family and youth perspective while also being a team collaboration and, and acknowledging the constraints and mandates that are out there in the team and in the, in the, uh, in the, in the environment. Um, that also we're looking again very holistically at the life of, of the young person and their family. When they identified needs, it's not I need therapy or, or a specific kind of, of, of service. It's what is it that I need to get my life on track to reach my goals um, in a, across multiple life domains. And that in, in a parallel way, the responses will be services and supports that may or may not be traditional. Um, and they, um, for each, individual child and family, they'll be different. There's a strong emphasis uh, in wraparound. You will often hear people saying that, you know, the team is there for the short term, but the family is embedded in, in their own support system for the long term. So how can we help those, both the formal and the informal systems, to work together and to ensure that the uh, informal system is bolstered so that when the formal systems are are drawing away from the family, the family is able to get support uh, in ways that uh, are present in their 
day-to-day -day lives and their communities and the interactions that they're that they're involved in. And finally, that um, that recognizing that the young person is is not existing alone, that there are, that the family includes adults and siblings, and that in order to make an improvement in a young person's life, it often requires giving support to the family as a whole, perhaps in terms of, of um, helping with rental or getting a car back on the road so that the, the parent can get to work or can transport the child, but also paying attention to the siblings um, as well. So for whom is Wraparound intended? Um, well, as we saw with our little poll, um, Wraparound in a sort of pragmatic level is intended to be those young people that cost a lot, but importantly, the young people who have really had bad outcomes despite having lots and lots of involvement with systems. And we see these youth, the reason that we know they're out there is because they have contact with lots of systems, often simultaneously. They may be involved in special education, um, in the mental health system, foster care, perhaps in juvenile justice. Um, most of the kids that we see in wraparound are involved in multiple systems, and their families may be involved in multiple systems as well. They also have the, their involvement in multiple systems typically reflects um, needs in multiple life domains, um, including things like uh, safety and family relationships, um, having success in school, progressing towards employment, and uh, having a, a safe uh, place to stay and a, and a consistent place to stay. Um, and then, of course, involvement with lots of systems brings involvement with lots of adults. And typically, um, when there is a, not a coordination between the adults that are important or that are figuring in, in the lives of these young people and families, their efforts are just not all kind of on the same page. So what Wraparound does um, and, and is very focused on is bringing all of these service represent, representatives who may have certain uh, level of, of ability to compel the family in certain ways, but to bring them all together on the same page to work with their mandates, to work with the, um, with the family's uh, perspective and the family's priorities and um, create a, a plan. So when we think of it in terms of the um, public health pyramid, which we're seeing more and more everywhere these days, um, next slide please, we're talking about when we see the whole population of youth, um, again we have you know, a large majority of youth who are not really involved in any specific services uh, targeted for mental health or related needs, um, but may be the focus anyway of, of prevention and universal health promotion through schools and elsewhere. Then we have a smaller proportion, we see the green 15% who are receiving the targeted intervention. And then even at the, t at the higher level, you've got about a total of 5% in the upper uh, point of the pyramid that are receiving a kind of probably highly individualized and fairly intense intervention. But even among those, we're talking about a full wraparound process, which is a costly and very labor-intensive uh, effort for the 2%, uh, uh, up to 2% of, of kids who have absolutely the highest level of needs and who are just not, not uh, profiting or, or, or making progress from the interventions that are being used um, previously. Yeah, and it's, it's worth noting that um, this is uh, describing the percent of youth in a typical community that might have these levels of need. We know pretty well that uh, 70, 80 percent of youth with these types of needs don't actually uh, receive the uh, targeted level of support that, that they require. So we're looking at this more from a kind of idealist view that this is what would be available to young people in any service system to meet their, their level of need. Okay, so just a really quick summary of, of the points we've covered so far. That wraparound developed, do you remember the why, um, and developed as an alternative to those siloed systems that just don't respond very well to the needs of youth and their families with the most complex needs. Um, it's intended for kids with uh, again, a high level of need and, and involvement with multiple agencies. And when it's implemented properly, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, uh, of the, the large percentage of the time in this webinar, talking about what that might mean, that it's this collaborative process that brings together um, the people who, are, who are, have a stake in seeing the child and family succeed. Um, it's uh, intended to overcome some of the most typical barriers, uh, lack of engagement, and again, that, that 
that lack of coordination across the teams, and the fact that teams that plans are often just not really responsive to the things that families identify as being their most important uh, needs. And finally, it, it helps build, um, build uh, with the families a sense of success, hope, self-efficacy, very important, social support, um, that, that which are uh, kind of the foundation we're hoping for their, their post-wraparound lives. All right, so now we're going to get into a couple ways of describing what wraparound actually consists of. And we, we like to start with um, the underlying value base. This is something that's been around for some time. There are 10 principles of wraparound. There's a lot of different ways you can describe the value base for wraparound. But what the NWI has done is, is take a lot of materials from past writing and, and past experts and, and talk about it in terms of 10 principles. Um, there is a chapter that focuses on all these principles in detail on the resource guide to wraparound. Again, just go to wrapinfo.org, click on resource guide, and you will find it there. Um, going ahead forward, we need to start moving a little quicker here. Mm -hmm. um, the first of the ten principles is probably the most important because it's, it flies in the face of what uh, systems do so typically with families and youth, is family voice and choice. Um, another way of looking at this is family-driven youth guided, which is the way systems of care describe this. So the idea being that family and youth perspectives are primary during the wraparound process, all throughout the process. The planning is grounded in the family members' perspectives on what they need, and the team provides options to them to ask what do they think would be the most likely way to meet those needs. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the next uh, principle, team-based. So this is the other big difference in wraparound. The wraparound team consists of many indiv individuals, multiple individuals, who are agreed upon by the family and committed to the family. You have people who are paid to care, uh, professionals, um, representatives from the school, and then you have people who are connected to the family through community and family um, relationships. But the point being that uh, one way or another, efforts brought together into a team to plan, the, to, to develop a plan, and then implement it over time. The next principle is natural supports. Um, another, uh, th this is probably one of the things that our fidelity measures suggest is one of the most difficult uh, things to achieve in the real world. Actually having individuals in the service system, a wraparound facilitator, um, perhaps working with family support partners, figuring out how to seek out and encourage the full participation of team members that are drawn from family members' networks of, of support. Um, the idea is for the wraparound plan to, uh, the wraparound team meetings to, in, to involve these individuals and for the plan to reflect that they are part, if not the most important part, um, they are certainly part of the, they, they are implementing the strategies um, for meeting the family and youth's needs. Uh, Jan, I've, I've lost track of who's doing which <laughs> slide, but you want to get up from there? Uh, okay, I'll do a couple. Um, so collaboration, again, this is really essential that um, the, the spirit of wraparound is cooperation. And sometimes the systems are antagonistic one to another, and sometimes there is uh, not a spirit of cooperation between the family and the provider. So the idea of wraparound is to really work and to do a careful team process that blends the perspectives, again, prioritizing the family perspective to produce a really a single plan. It may not be a single plan documented in exactly the same way in each system, but it's consistent. What are the strategies? What are the goals uh, from system to system? And that that plan guides and coordinates each team, mem each team member's work towards meeting the goals on the wraparound plan. Community-based, um, again, not necessarily uh, surprising, but the goal of wraparound is really to try to keep uh, the families and young people together and to keep the young people in as home-like an environment and in in as much in their own communities as, as is conceivably possible, and that the service and support strategies take place in the most inclusive, uh, responsive, and accessible and least restrictive, that's important, settings uh, that they can possibly be. There's really two pieces of community-based, which is that maintenance in the, in the community and then also integrating the family and youth into the community. And you'll see a couple resources there at the bottom that are about implementing community-driven wraparound. Um, 
and about uh, community teams and how they can be involved in overseeing the integration of individual families into the community. Sorry about that. Go on ahead. No, it's good. Um, culturally competent, the wraparound process is, is explicit about uh, ways to demonstrate respect and uh, respect for and build on the values, um, beliefs, and culture of a child or youth and their family and also of their community in this uh, in, in uh, assessment, in, in strategies for treatment, and in looking for that natural support as well. Yeah, and some folks, um, you know, point out that just by being family-driven and youth-guided, that really does help encourage uh, cultural competence because it's really from the voice and the perspective of the family rather than perhaps professionals or others. Um, but there really also needs to be attention to the, uh, the, the culture uh, uh, the, of the family. And so we put this resource here um, from the TA partnership that's all about um, cultural and linguistic competence in systems of care. There's an entire community of practice about this that talks about tailoring and matching to specific um, cultural groups, and I encourage folks to check that out. So again, I mean, similar to cultural competence, some people will say, well, if you're really listening to the young person and their family, you will get an individualized plan, but this principle is very specific about that, that, that each plan really reflects uh, the goals and aspirations of a particular family and that the strategies and that are going to be uh, used, the services and supports to reach the family's goals are going to be, they're going to look very different from one plan to another. So this, this, this principle just really reiterates that as a, as a central, um, central theme for wraparound. Um, and then strengths-based is a really uh, core component of wraparound. We'll see later that uh, how important we think that is in um, achieving the outcomes that are that are uh, we hope to see from wraparound, but that uh, the whole process is something that helps people, all team members, but particularly of course the the child and family, to uh, feel the strengths that they have to understand how they can use their strengths to um, to to help meet the goals that are important in their own lives and then also to use the strengths and assets that are present in their informal support networks and in their community as a whole. Want and uh, mm -hmm. last two principles, one, the, the, the ninth principle is unconditional care or unconditional uh, commitment to families. The real core aspect of this is this first bullet that um, we really need to make sure that the folks who are participating in a wraparound initiative are committed to the mental framework that in wraparound we do not give up on, we do not blame, we do not reject children, youth, and their families, regardless of how complex their needs are, regardless of what kind of setbacks the team has. The idea is, is that in wraparound you continue to work towards meeting the needs of that young person and their family and achieving the goals that have been established uh, by that family and their team. Uh, families don't fail, plans fail. And if there, you know, uh, I think Carl Dennis would say is, is that a crisis is what happens when the adults don't know what to do. Um, so what we need to have is an outlook that says um, we will endeavor to put together a plan that will meet the needs regardless of how challenging uh, they may be to meet. And there's an entire discussion of unconditional care. There was a movement towards uh, changing the title of this uh, principle to persistence rather than unconditional because some folks thought that it was um, unrealistic to say that our care would be unconditional. But after some debate among the NWI, you, which you can read about on the web, um, it was decided that really unconditional care is the ideal we're striving for. And then finally, something I'm very interested in all the time is a researcher outcomes based. And this is part of the process uh, that is about identifying uh, very clear goals for families. The family should be identifying um, their own goals first. The team can chime in about uh, structuring what the goals are that they will work towards as a team. And then strategies are explicitly linked to meeting those goals. And in every meeting, the team should be um, assessing whether progress is being made towards uh, those goals or towards meeting the needs of the family. This is the the crux of outcomes based, but it also means that you're, as a community, measuring outcomes of wraparound and whether it is working at a community level. Um, and you can see articles and resources on uh, the, the web 
Um, you know, it seems like a good place to describe uh, the NWI's toolkit. There's an, uh, literally dozens of tools that have been used by wraparound initiatives across the country, including tools for setting goals and measuring progress. And there's also some very specific articles on accountability in wraparound in Chapter 5 of our resource guide, which you can find, again, at wrapinfo.org. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, launch our next poll here um, about which of the principles you think would be hardest to do in your community. We wanted to include all ten of them, but um, unfortunately our software here only allows us to do five. So if you want to go ahead and vote on that, I'm going to move ahead into the next slide and, and talk in the background. Um, one of the things that, that we found in our early research, and, and wraparound really was originally defined in terms of the principles, um, but then that left a lot of questions about exactly what is the nature of the practice that lives up to those principles. And before there had been a lot of, um, well, public discussion or consensus about what the practice should be, I was part of a team that did some research um, going around the country and observing wraparound teams. And we found immense variability in terms of what teams were actually doing and a lot of uncertainty among the people who were charged with carrying out wraparound about what they were supposed to do. Um, and some of the things that we found was that fewer than a third of the teams actually even maintained a wraparound plan that had clear goals written on it. Um, that many teams were not really going through the planning, the essential kind of step of planning where once you've identified a need of trying to um, create several options for strategies for, for meeting a need before picking one. So often what will happen, the typical situation will be a need will be identified and a service solution will be immediately proposed as, as a response to that. Um, we found that interventions were only rarely individualized and that natural supports or, or any community supports were rarely present uh, on wraparound on wraparound plans or discussed during meetings. And we just saw, in fact, a lot of chaos in teams and a lot of uh, reactivity as where wraparound is supposed to be focused on the proactive and moving the family forward. When the teams were always reacting to the latest crisis, it was sometimes hard to um, feel that there was any, any forward movement. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now. And before we move on to um, our discussion of practice, to share the results here. <clears throat> so your research, and it showed all of these things were, were challenging, individualizing, um, basing strategies on strengths. But it looks like the, uh, the participants have identified natural supports as the thing that might be the hardest to achieve. You all found that in your research, too, didn't you? We did, and, and I think it's, it's actually been noted in several studies, um, the inclusion of natural supports and how to integrate those into the plan, how to keep people involved is a big challenge. And I think the participants also saying that the collaboration is difficult. That certainly uh, it, it is tough when you have all these systems who are not used to working together, possibly not used to the wraparound paradigm and the way that that works. Um, particularly with family voice and choice. So there we have our second. Yep, go ahead. OK, I'm going to hide that one. Yep. So as see that people seem to say that individualized would be the least difficult one to implement. But um, it does seem as though it can be very tough sometimes to actually come up with um, unique strategies to meet families' needs. The teams I've participated on and, and, and observed, that is a challenge as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are ready to talk about practice. So this was sort of, again, an, an evolution uh, once we had, were clear about the principles, but still uh, it was not just our research that was turning up this variability in practice, and there was um, a, a lot of uh, concern that <clears throat> if practice wasn't more clearly identified that people would be calling whatever they were doing, whatever they wanted to call, they would call that wraparound, and that would lead to a lot of problems in the field with quality control, obviously, um, and sort of would ultimately perhaps undermine the credibility of the whole effort. <clears throat> so this was actually the issue that was the, the one around which the National Wraparound Initiative most clearly uh, came together. Um, again, that was back in 2004. And so the National Wraparound Initiative uh, worked with um, existing models to come up and to build a fairly formal um, uh, consensus about what it was absolutely kind of essential to have happen during the wraparound process. 
And what we started out with was a review. We had all, our, all of our, again, we identified these expert members. We had everybody contributed their existing manuals and so on. We went through those and tried to um, come up with uh, a practice model that included the things that were most commonly included as well as things that, that seemed to be considered essential. Um, and so we had uh, our whole entire advisor, uh, Na National Wraparound Initiative Advisory Group, which I think was about 60 people at that time, review and sort of vote on each thing and how important it was and how it should be worded and so on. So then we went back and revised the whole thing over again um, so that we had a very high level of consensus about what was, was important. And what was interesting about this was that it was nothing that, that it didn't include anything nobody had ever heard of before that was really surprising, but it was different from uh, anything that had been laid out before. Um, and it was very specific about four phases of wraparound and specific activities that needed to be accomplished. Um, and the idea was that if we could ensure that practice was consistent, this would help in a number of ways for everybody concerned with wraparound. First of all, it would allow for some quality assurance. Some people, especially family members, wanted to make sure that if they, if they wanted wraparound, they were actually getting something uh, that looked like what the practice model would be that was a kind of a high quality and, and adhered to the principles. Um, but also, it's, it plays a very important role in in research because obviously if you want to see if wraparound works, you have to know if wraparound was actually done. And to know if wraparound was actually done, you have to know if what it is. Um, and then finally, for our, our other purposes with the National Wraparound Initiative, once people were, were on the same page and had a shared model of what, of what the practice of wraparound would be, it enabled people to share a lot more in terms of their resources so that a family guide that was written in Kansas might be used by another, one, another program. Um, in California, and eventually the National Wraparound Initiative put together its own resource guide so that every community didn't have to start with um, publishing its own guide, that they could use ours and that it would be relevant to the model that they would have in place there. Right, so um, the, the uh, user's guide to wraparound is something that is freely available on the NWI website. And again, you know, some communities and initiatives have adopted different approaches than are described in that user's guide. Um, but a lot of folks have found it very useful in terms of explaining what wraparound practice looks like, what the principles look like. And in fact, sometimes they use it as an orientation directly for families. In fact, it's called a handbook for families. You can find that on our website as well. So the idea here, as Janet was saying, was is that um, we didn't want this to be something that was so rigid that everyone had to do it like wraparound robots. We sometimes have some concerns that people are taking a little bit too literally. But nonetheless, we, our sense is, from having done evaluations of our work and asking people in the field, that overall it's been helpful to the field to describe wraparound in terms of phases and activities that actually can uh, be applied in, in, in practice in order to live up to those 10 principles. So the four phases of wraparound are a, an initial phase of engagement and support, as well as preparing the team to get together and work together, followed by a phase of initial plan development, um, an implementation phase that is, rec that is generally uh, the longest phase uh, in the process where um, strategies are implemented, and then we uh, check in over time to make sure goals are being met and plan is revised if necessary. And then a transition phase, that doesn't necessarily mean transition out of uh, all services, but transition out of uh, this more intensive uh, formal wraparound process. And again, uh, these phases and the activities, which we'll go through real quickly here, um, go on ahead there, uh, Sarah. And so in the first phase, you, you can find all of the details about the typical, again, typical phases and activities of wraparound. Not that this is the only way to do it. Um, but this is what our experts said typically uh, take place in wraparound. So in the first phase, you can find all this on our website. Um, the first phase, this engagement and team preparation phase in which a wraparound facilitator, sometimes they're called a care coordinator, sometimes in partnership with a family support partner, a family member who's been there with their uh, children, um, who is part of the process, um, these individuals meet with the family, uh, gather perspectives on their strengths and their needs, uh, they're doing this all before the first team meeting. They're assessing for the safety and the, 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 um, uh, the safety of the family, provide a, a crisis or stabilization response if necessary right away. 
Um, if not, then they go ahead and explain the wraparound process, identify child and family team members that might uh, be relevant to that family, um, uh, complete some strengths and needs summaries, and arrange for that initial wraparound planning meeting with the individuals that uh, uh, are going to be relevant to this family, to meeting this family. In the next phase of work, uh, the initial plan development phase, which takes place over um, sometimes only one, but often two or three meetings, um, you have those first plan of care development meetings, these first team meetings. You're, you're or orienting the different team members to what wraparound is. Uh, the, the facilitator, again, sometimes in partnership with a family partner, sometimes also with a, a youth advocate, are presenting strengths um, and need summaries. They're soliciting additional strength. Uh, they're, they're getting the, the team to talk about additional strengths of the family as well as of the support system for the family and the community, things that they can draw upon to develop a good plan. They create a team mission um, saying, what is it as a team that we are looking to achieve on behalf of this youth and family, something that kind of brings them together um, and, and, and helps develop some kind of clarity about what they're working towards. Because oftentimes, as Janet was saying, you observe a wraparound team meeting, and it is not always that clear exactly what the team is working towards. It seems more like um, kind of a reactive response amongst a, a number of people to, a, to the crisis of the week or the month. So you have this team mission. You have these need statements. And during the course of this initial uh, plan development phase, you're brainstorming ways to meet the needs that have been identified. Um, and and uh, brainstorm the strategies that are going to involve uh, the different members of the team. And that team is, uh, th that plan is uh, documented and distributed to all the team members. Next slide. Again, typical activities. During the plan implementation uh, and refinement phase, you're holding regular team meetings. Um, the team is getting feedback on uh, whether the goals are uh, uh, we're making progress towards goals. What are the accomplishment, accomplishments in implementing the different strategies and, and uh, supports that are in the plan? And you're assessing whether or not uh, the team members have followed through on their assignments and their responsibilities and whether they're getting the team closer to meeting needs or achieving goals that have been set. If necessary, you modify the plan, adjusting services, stopping services if they're not working or if they're no longer needed. Um, and again, continually updating the plan and making sure everyone's on the same page about what the strategies are, trying to keep it to a reasonable amount of effort. Um, John Vandenberg talks about how ideally there's one plan that cuts across all the child serving systems and all of the people who are involved in the, um, in the, in the, in the, in the youth's life. That may not be, um, that may not be feasible in all cases. It may not be something that we can truly expect to, to occur in the, in the context of so many different child-serving systems. But nonetheless, you're hoping that all of the systems are on board with the wraparound plan and that their individual plans reflect um, what's been decided by this team in terms of the core strategies uh, to meet the needs of the family. And then finally, the transition phase of wraparound is really something that, that takes place over the course of the entire process. Because you're, at the very beginning, saying to the family, um, please tell us um, what your vision for the future is. What will things look like when they're better and when you're feeling as though um, you, you know, what you're hoping for for your child and your family um, is, is in place? So you're, you're actually, at the very beginning, getting the family to describe what a, what a better life will look like. You're at the very beginning of the plan development phase, identifying your team's mission. How will we know we're no longer needed? How do we know when the goals have been met for this family? Um, so you have aspects of transition planning throughout the process, involving natural supports and community supports who will be there at the end of the formal wraparound process. But there's also a formal transition phase in which you identify a transition, you create a transition plan, you identify who will be involved after formal wraparound. Perhaps you even rehearse what uh, the response will be um, if certain problems arise or crises arise. Um, and you formalize how follow-up by team members or perhaps even, if necessary, you would restart the wraparound process if necessary. And certainly, just as you're supposed to do throughout the whole wraparound process, you're celebrating the achievements of this team and this family in a way that's appropriate to the team and the family. So boy, that, that, 
That's a real, uh, a real whirlwind uh, overview there. We'll get into more details in our uh, next webinar, which will be about supporting implementation. Um, I guess that's uh, April uh, 18th, I believe. But that's, that's the overview. Okay, and I've, um, I've launched our third poll here, and I think I'll let people go ahead and uh, respond to that while Eric, uh, go ahead and just uh, do your ruminations on the practice model. <laughs> My ruminations on the practice model. Well, um, you know, again, I, I think that uh, the NWI was trying to support um, several things by developing this practice model. Um, we were trying to develop the development, we, we were trying to support the development of some implementation and fidelity measures, um, but we also think that by trying to clarify what the typical activities are in the wraparound process, we were trying to help provide guidance to uh, different places out there that might be interested in wraparound but not uh, sure exactly what it meant. Um, so the NWI description is something that's not supposed to be the, the only uh, flavor of wraparound that's uh, available to communities or the only way to do this, um, but something that's supposed to be the basis um, uh, provide a, a kind of a core description of the wraparound practice model uh, for the field. Um, you know, as Janet said, the phases and activities, as we just gave in this overview, and our, there's a lot more detail on the web, it's supposed to be specific enough to provide guidance, um, but flexible enough to provide a lot of ways in which you could do these things. They don't have to be carried out in a specific order. Um, and they're not meant to imply that there's only one type of person who has to facilitate all these activities. A lot of communities and initiatives have paid wraparound facilitators. But ultimately, in, uh, depending on the community or the initiative or the team, the responsibility for facilitating the wraparound process, taking the lead, can be shared among a number of different people. It could be the wraparound facilitator. It could be a, a family support partner. It could be uh, the parent or caregiver or the youth themselves, and it could change over time. So again, please, as you're, as you're considering what we've put together in terms of the wraparound practice model, recognize that this is really supposed to be more of a kind of um, a guideline rather than some sort of hard and fast um, description of what has to happen over the course of wraparound. Okay, I'm, I'm putting up the poll results here, and I, I think it's also worth reiterating, and Eric mentioned this before, that um, you know there are other models out there that are similar to the NWI model, but not exactly uh, that, that one. Um, and here our polls show, and this likely reflect, reflects also the fact that we have uh, publicized the webinars through our own network, so a lot of people who are familiar with the National Wraparound Initiative and its activities. but. Um, that one seems to be the, the green leader at this point. Um, and also a lot of people who don't know exactly what the model is, um, which uh, may reflect uh, that the model is not well defined, or it may reflect that these are pe people who are in a community where there's wraparound, but they're not necessarily familiar with what the wraparound is. Um, and then no wraparound, again, I think reflecting communities that are considering wraparound, um, and then other models in some cases. Yep, and I think this percent, 54 percent, consistent with NWI description. If you if you presented that practice model three or four years ago, five years ago, and said, "Is this the what the wraparound looks like in your community?" I think it'd be a lot lower percent. Um, and you know, maybe that's good. We certainly have research that we'll show in a minute that suggests that um, doing wraparound in this intensive uh, way. Uh, seems to get you better outcomes than doing it in less intensive ways or doing um, or, or serving these families in a way that uh, doesn't bring this kind of support to bear at all. So hopefully this is a, a represents or reflects uh, progress in the field that so many folks uh, say that they've got this kind of uh, intensive wraparound process in their community. Well, Janet, it is now uh, 12 o'clock our time, 3 o'clock Eastern time. I oh, think yikes. we're <laughs> need to try to uh, finish up rather quickly so we can have some time for questions. We will be going until uh, 3.30 Eastern Time, 12.30 Pacific Time. Okay, so we're going to try to zip through this. Well, um, very quickly, uh, we get a lot of questions about high fidelity wraparound. And um, what, we, what we aspire to with high fidelity wraparound is something that really uh, adheres to the principles. Um, next slide. Let's go through these quick. So how do you know if you're doing high fidelity? Well, you have to have two things, really. First of all, you have to have a model so that you know fidelity means how close are you to the model. So 
you have to have a model, and then secondly, you have to measure how well your practice uh, stacks up to the model. So really, in essence, you can't have high fidelity wraparound unless you know through measurement that you are doing it. So getting trained in something called high fidelity wraparound is all very fine, but until you know that you're actually doing wraparound in a high fidelity way by measuring it, um, it's not really valid to claim that you are. So there's a lot of confusion out there about that, whether a community is aspiring to high wraparound fidelity or whether they've actually achieved it. Yeah, and I think that one of the things we just want to kind of make clear is, is that um, we think that uh, high fidelity uh, refers to, as Janet was just saying, um, aspiring to achieve a well-defined model and having some way of uh, acknowledging or assessing um, implementation that gives you confidence that you're getting there, that you're getting um, to the level of implementation that you're striving for. High fidelity wraparound doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be to this NWI model. It doesn't necessarily mean that you just, um, that uh, uh, a certain kind of uh, training or technique is going to get you to high fidelity because you invest in it. Our sense is, is that high fidelity represents um, a, you know, a quality of practice that's high enough to um, live up to the model that you are attempting to implement. Um, like we say, the NWI is attempting to kind of provide guidance to the field, but there's a lot of other ways that you can do this work, and high fidelity in our mind is, is uh, about achieving the model that you're attempting to achieve. Now, that said, um, we did set out to define a practice model for wraparound, um, at least partly because as a researcher, I was very interested in um, furthering the work of my mentor, John Burchard from the University of Vermont, passed away in 2004, the same year that we really started the NWI in earnest. Um, wanted to further his work of being able to assess uh, quality and fidelity of wraparound so that we would be able to help communities um, assess their own fidelity, assess their own practice, and also do better research. So we've created uh, measures of the wraparound fidelity assessment system. Again, you can find descriptions of these measures by going to wrapinfo.org and clicking on the appropriate link. Um, the three measures that we've developed is one that's uh, been very long standing, about uh, 10 years running now, the wraparound fidelity index. And this is interviews with caregivers, youth, uh, facilitators, and team members and uh, has been used really widely for pro by programs to try to keep themselves on track with respect to their own fidelity of implementation um, and to help them, to help those of us who do research on wraparound know whether or not it's being implemented as intended when we are doing research on outcomes. We need to be able to understand why we are or aren't getting uh, the outcomes we're looking to achieve and measuring quality and fidelity is part of that. Um, the second uh, measure we've developed is a team observation measure, which is a checklist filled out by an observer at team meetings. And then finally, we have a document review measure that we're currently revising. And you can go to a chapter in the resource guide to wraparound. Again, you can uh, see the link here. It's a very long link, but you can go to our resource guide and find it um, through wraparoundwrapinfo.org, or you can get these slides on our website and uh, click on that link. Um, so that's a real, o real o serious overview uh, of, the th of these three practice uh, implementation measures. Um, but we're going to uh, dedicate an entire webinar to measuring quality and outcomes of wraparound in June. OK, and, and also in the interest of time, I'm also going to go to the serious overview of the system of change. I, had a, I mean, the theory of change. I had a whole lot of animated slides here. But um, actually, Sarah, I'm going to ask you to skip through to the last slide that shows the whole theory of change. Um, essentially what the theory of change is, um, was an effort for us to assemble all the relevant research and all of our common sense thinking about wraparound, put them together to say what is it exactly that we're doing in wraparound and how does it impact outcomes. And uh, just keep going um, there, oops, that essentially, um, so probably best to refer you to the, uh, again, that resource down at the bottom on the, on the uh, theory of change. But really what we're talking about here is change that happens in, in kind of two, uh, two main routes in a way. One is that the things that we do in wraparound to engage families, to make sure that services are relevant to them, and to make, uh, to get everybody on the same page, have two, have, have 
have impacts that come from both making the services and the package of services that families receive more effective. If, they're, if the families are more engaged, if they're more committed to services, if they even show up at the front door and keep going, we're going to get better outcomes than if, if they were missing a lot of appointments, didn't feel that the services were relevant, or even if the services had conflicting uh, goals for the family. Um, then the other thing that we also hypothesize through our theory of change is that the family's participation in a strengths-based process where they see and take a main role in making a positive improvement in their life and where other people around them are modeling, these are the steps to go through for forming goals and moving towards them, increases the family's feelings that they can manage uh, things in their lives, their cope, improves their coping spill, skills, helps them in, in many cases to replace coping skills that were not necessarily, uh, that were adaptive but not necessarily over the long run going to get them where they wanted to with coping skills that, that will get them to their longer term goals. Helping with problem solving, helping with feelings of empowerment, and last but certainly not least, helping them build their uh, sense of optimism that they can get to goals um, that they set for themselves. So what's interesting about these is that that's, even though we don't call wraparound necessarily an intervention per se, we do believe that it has an impact and that it should have an impact on the family that is independent of the services that they re receive, the services and supports that are in the plan, and that those do come through uh, their participation in the wraparound process. And finally, we also think that there is a very much a kind of interactivity among all of these strands of the ways that wraparound works. So um, that's described, it's, it's even simplified in this diagram, which looks like it has a lot of arrows in it. Um, but that, you know, things don't just move from left to right, that there's kind of a cycling and an iteration, and that, that um, there can be a virtuous cycle that sets up where success in services, uh, contributes to, uh, also contributes to coping and empowerment where success in the wraparound and process itself may make families do better in certain of the services they get and so on. Um, but again, we encourage you to look at, there's a lot of research that substantiates all of this um, and that can be drawn on. Again, to, this is essentially a great big hypothesis or a set of hypotheses about why it is that wraparound and its particular principles and practice um, contributes to the outcomes that we hope to see. So we're going to move along again, uh, in the interest of time, go right into um, um, into uh, implementation support. So this again was something my interest in this uh, stemmed from my research looking at, at teams and finding, uh, talking to people who were on teams and, and listening to them talk about how hard it was sometimes when you need to have a great process going. Um, but how can, you get, how can you get the services and supports you need out of the system? Sometimes systems just not constructed to provide the kinds of services and supports that families really think that they need. Um, and simultaneously, uh, even at the organizational level, you have people who are really eager to do the wraparound process, but they don't necessarily have the experience or the know-how to do it. So what does their organization need to provide for them in terms of things like coaching, supervision, and feedback, caseload sizes, and so on? So we uh, eventually um, did a bunch of research and interviewing that resulted in a framework of what we call these necessary support conditions, conditions at the organization and the system level that need to be in place for wraparound teams to be able to succeed. Um, and as you can see, a burnout is very likely and common um, when team members feel like they're struggling against um, just, just to, to, to find that support in their environments. So we have this um, little picture that we use that a lot of times people, we, we realize that teams are nested in their organizations and in the larger system. And a lot of times we spend a lot of effort trying to make our teams more effective on training at the team level. But sometimes uh, there is a, a sort of a relative neglect of what about that, that those the um, features that need to happen at the organization level. Um, <laughs> something weird going on here. But anyway, they, in order to make teams effective, then you need to have organizations that are supportive and you need a system that provides the kind of resources, the access to the types of services that you need, where um, say child welfare and juvenile justice are kind of on the same page, where they're willing to accept the strengths-based plan as, as part of, as legitimate for their own agency plan. So, um, 
based on our research, we can go to the next slide, hopefully that will work, um, we identified or we have categorized um, the system and organizational support into six areas. And we have them listed here. And these are also, these areas are now provide a kind of a framework for us and uh, ultimately also on the website to provide resources in each of these areas. So these have to do with community partnership. Do we have a collaboration? Do we have the right people at the table to help us oversee our wraparound project? Number two, does that group of people, have they identified their target population? Do they have, um, do they have a strategic plan? Have they started to make steps on achieving that strategic plan? Have they, do they have the policies and are they continuing to troubleshoot as they move along? Fiscal policies obviously are the resources there to create and sustain the wraparound program and, and ensure that the, that the services and supports continue to be available. Do we have the range of services and supports that, that families typically need for their wraparound program uh, for the, to fulfill their plan? In terms of human resources, do we have the right jobs? Do we have the right people in the jobs? Do we have the right supervision? Do we have the right caseloads? Um, do people have enough time to do their jobs? And finally, accountability, in order to have a handle on all of these things, are we using data uh, and feeding back that data into our decision-making processes so that we know um, how well we're doing in each of these different areas. Are we providing good services and supports? Are we uh, moving ahead with our strategic plan? Uh, what's our turnover? Things like that. So this led us to create the sort of fourth element, if you remember that original slide when the wraparound fidelity assessment system called the Community Supports for Wraparound Inventory. And this is a web-based survey that is taken by people in a given community who know about uh, these sort of um, policy system and organizational level things. Typically we have all sorts of stakeholders, including family members who are responding to this. And they rate a series of items about stakeholder, about how the community is doing in terms of supporting wraparound in each of the areas that I mentioned uh, just before. And then an individualized report, complete report on the findings is sent to the community to use as input into their strategic planning process. And sometimes we have communities now that have done the CSWI more than once uh, so that they can see how their efforts are panning out. Okay, so. We are over time, um, but the summary here is, is that uh, implementing wraparound uh, requires that people in the community embrace its pr principles, uh, but there are also some basic activities that uh, really sh are typically part and parcel of the process. And uh, to do any of this well, um, in adhering to the principles, uh, implementing the practice model really does require support of the nature that Janet just described from the host agency and the overall system. So let's launch our last poll, and then I'm going to do uh, basically a one-minute overview of research on wraparound so we can get to some questions. Um, I am curious, as a researcher who has conducted several studies on wraparound, um, what people think currently, what would you say is the current status of research on wraparound? Um, and there's no real right answer to this question. Um, as much as people want to think that evidence-based practices are things that are well known and understood, there's a lot of different criteria out there. So I'm kind of curious whether folks out there are perceiving wraparound as being an evidence-based practice, a promising practice, or something that we don't really have enough evidence to even consider it something that's been tested. Um, we've got a good 60% of the votes in now. And a uh, pretty even split between evidence-based practice and promising practice. Um, I'm going to uh, give about t 10 more seconds for folks to voice their opinion. Uh, I think that y the split in our attendees is pretty typical in the field, or it, re it really mm -hmm. does reflect where people feel like we are in the field. And I would say that it's, it's, pretty, um, it, it's pretty appropriate to kind of consider wraparound on the cusp of being considered an evidence-based practice. So there's our, there's our, our breakdown. Um, let's take a look at the data really quick, some of the data that we refer to when we ask whether or not there's a research base on wraparound. And thanks to everyone for voting. Um, really quick, boy, how quick can I do this? Let's see. First, we got right. um, Does wraparound work? How do we know? There are entire chapters in your resource guide to wraparound that you can read about this. But some of the things that make us think wraparound work is there are communities out there, such as wraparound Milwaukee, assumed responsibility <laughs> All youth at, 
at risk of a residential level of care. And when they took over responsibility for those kids, they reduced that county's reliance on RTCs, residential treatment, and psych inpatient um, utilization dramatically. Next slide. So we've got the community level stories um, are, are growing out there, and wraparound Milwaukee is just one of them. When we start doing some research, we see that when you compare wraparound to um, uncoordinated services as usual, wraparound tends to pretty consistently, you can see these orange bars from a study we did in Nevada um, early on, wraparound, 81% of the kids that were in, in wraparound uh, 18 months later were in a less restrictive placement than where they started. Um, compared to traditional services, where only 36% kids were in less restrictive placement 18 months after uh, the commencement of services. Next slide. We also we see a lot of evidence out there about um, wraparound being successful in achieving perhaps that number one priority of keeping kids at home in their community. We also see um, in, from a different study in Nevada, bigger group of kids, comparing kids to getting wraparound to traditional services more dramatic improvement in their functioning, so a reduction in their functional impairment on the CAFIS, Child Adolescent Functional Assessment uh, Scale. Next one. Next slide. Um, we've seen Im improvements or, or impact on recidivism in juvenile justice, such as from Clark County, Washington, a published controlled study showing that wraparound, a wraparound program, the kids were three times less likely to commit felony offenses than a matched comparison group and took three, three times longer on average to commit that first offense. Next slide. So the bottom line here is, is that we, um, when we, we did a meta-analysis, which is considered to be a step towards establishing the evidence base for an intervention, you'll see that in wraparound we have um, populations of focus, mental health, child welfare, juvenile justice. Wraparound is applied to so many different types of young people. And we, we found seven studies. There have now been nine published controlled studies, but at the time there were seven. Go to the next slide. And what we found was is that um, if you looked at the outcomes across all those studies, we found a significant moderate size effect on keeping kids in the community and in, in homes and reducing placement changes. We saw a small to moderate sized effect for mental health, school, and community outcomes. And ultimately, the overall effect size is about the same as for other evidence-based treatments when you compare them to some comparison um, type of treatment. And there's an article um, at the bottom of the slide that you can go to to see this meta-analysis. But the other piece of the research picture is that ensuring fidelity to the model, doing a full wraparound process that lives up to the principles is critical. Fidelity studies show, as we've already talked about, that engaging uh, natural supports, getting kids involved in community activities, use basing strengths or basing services and strategies on strengths, having a, a well-implemented uh, team process, these things tend not to happen in real-world wraparound. So go to the next slide there. Um, we really need um, high-quality wraparound programs and teams that understand the model they're implementing follow the 10 principles, implement the basic activities, and receive training and support. The people who are in lead roles need to receive training and ongoing support to implement the model consistently. We also think that using data at the supervision level, at an evaluation level, is very useful because what get, gets measured gets done. Um, last slide here. Um, we have found that there is a connection between wraparound fidelity and outcomes. Providers whose families experience better outcomes tend to have better fidelity, communities and wraparound initiatives, and we're beginning to see even states with average fidelity scores being higher are getting better outcomes for their families. Training and coaching and those community level supports that Janet described are found to be associated with better fidelity. Fidelity is associated with better outcomes. This is the case with all evidence-based practices where the research has been done uh, that I know of. So the last slide here kind of shows the little, um, oh, not the last slide quite yet. So the idea here is work with your host agency. Make sure people are supported through training, coaching, and supervision. Collect data that helps you know whether wraparound is being implemented fully. Um, and make sure that you have a community team that is working together to build a supportive system for wraparound. 
Um, last slide there shows this little flow chart. Those community supports, that good human resource support, training, coaching, quality assurance, helps get us to adherence to those wraparound principles, which gets us to improved child and family outcomes. So we are about 20 <laughs> minutes for time. We do this a lot. But in the future, we will try to leave more time. This is our overview. But we are going to get into more detail about all these topics. On April 20th, we're going to have Mary Jo Myers from Wraparound Milwaukee and Michelle Zabel from uh, the Innovations Institute in Maryland um, give some details on implementing a team-based wraparound model and how to train and coach folks to do it. Um, May 18th, uh, Janet's going to take the lead in reviewing uh, necessary community and program structures, get into more detail about those issues. And on uh, June 15th, we're going to talk about measurement and accountability and quality assurance. We then have two additional uh, webinars scheduled for August and September, and we're going to uh, program those to be as responsive to people's needs as we can. Um, should we launch the last poll, Janet? Uh, you know, we could only do five polls, so okay. we don't actually have another poll. All right, so we will, we will uh, query folks who are on this webinar later to ask what they think might be the most important topics. We'll do that throughout these first four months. Mm -hmm. um, what should we do now? Well, I just wanted to put in a little plug for the National Wraparound Initiative. As I mentioned, we started with a very small group, and we are going to be uh, expanding, we're hoping to launch in April. And uh, in fact, if you go to our website, you will see a preview of the new website as well as a link to the old website where for now we're posting all the stuff. So if you do, uh, and we encourage you to go to the website, uh, make sure that, that you're also clicking on that link right on the front of the new website to check out all the stuff that's available on the old website. We've migrated a lot of that, uh, but not, not completely made it live yet. Um, and we are going to be uh, inviting all of you to become members of the NWI in the near future. Um, the last two slides, one is, um, again, we are, I, I've received several questions about these. Yes, we are going to post these slides on our website. Again, these will be on the old website for now. Eventually, they will also be on the new website. It will be really clear where the webinar stuff is. We'll have all the, all the uh, in fact, people can listen to the entire webinar uh, on the new site once we get that set up. In the meantime, there are other resources here listed. You can get these slides. We will um, post them, as I mentioned, on the website uh, right after we're done talking. And the, finding the last slide here is the uh, website. Uh, again, this will take you directly. This is uh, to, you can use that wrapinfo.org uh, is, is a perfectly good way to get to this same site. This is the National Wraparound Initiative website. You'll get a sneak preview of our new look. And also, you'll have the link to the old website where on the home page of that, at the top of the news, we'll, we'll publish um, all of the webinar slides for this. I did want to just respond to a couple of other questions that people have already asked. Um, several people asked about the slides. Um, Oof. Does mental health provider, uh, do you find it requires a culture change to implement wraparound? Very much so. Um, that definitely uh, find, even where people are kind of receptive to the ideas of doing family-driven care, it's hard to actually implement that and to sort of understand what kind of processes and practices lead to that. Um, to that. Yeah, we, we, uh, we, you know, that's kind of part of the community supports that are necessary is that there is an, a bill, some mechanism through which the different uh, providers, whether they're mental health providers, uh, caseworkers, probation officers, um, are oriented to the wraparound principles and um, have supervisors that um, explain to them and, and then supervise them in a way that says, this is the way we do business in our community with these families now. These are the principles that we're working within, and participating in wraparound is uh, part of your job. So I'm thinking if you want to, at this point, raise your hand. I'm going to uh, clear all the There was one hand raiser before, but that person seems to have left. So if you have a question, um, use your hand raiser, and I will unmute you and give you a chance to talk. So um, go ahead and do that. I'm waiting to see if we have any. I don't blame people for being daunted by the technology. It's pretty 
pretty complex. Um. You can also feel free to send uh, additional questions through the uh, message board or the question board here. Well, here's the one that we've received then uh, by, by text. Uh, one, quickly, what are the old and new web addresses? So just use that new web address that's there on the sign now on the uh, slide, and it'll take you, there'll be a link there to click to the old one. But in the near future, the new, new site will be live. Another question that was asked was, are there free orientations to wraparounds that are available um, through the NWI? To some extent, you know, these webinars are one way for us to kind of get information and connections to the resources out to folks. Um, however, we will be um, doing some orientations to the basics of wraparound, uh, fidelity measurement, training and coaching at settings such as the uh, Georgetown University Training Institutes that are taking place in Washington, D.C. Um, area in July. We will have a, a, a post-conference institute, targeted institute, on this material. But ultimately, I think it's important to recognize that um, actually uh, getting support to implement wraparound is typically a pretty complex business for the staff who have responsibility for it. And finding some way to access adequately intensive um, training and coaching and support to supervisors to um, help ensure that the staff um, are sticking to the principles and the model is pretty important, not something that is typically uh, able to be achieved in, um, uh, in, in a brief um, seminar or presentation. Um, so the NWI is working with some of our um, partners to ask how do we make that kind of technical assistance and training and so forth more clearly available to the field, and, and I would say stay tuned to see how we, um, how we approach that over time. Okay, well I'm going to experiment here with our hand raisers, so I'm going to the first person in queue. I have just oops, I've unmuted uh, Philip Millay, so go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so I had a little little trouble hearing, but uh, if I correct me if I'm wrong, that you were interested in in uh, what is it exactly that youth guided or youth driven would mean? Yes. Uh, well, this is um this is a big topic um, and one that I'm particularly very invested in because um, some of my recent research really has to do with how much are youth participating on their own wraparound teams and what are what are the strategies for engaging them. Um, what we typically find in wraparound is that a lot of the engagement is focused on uh, the parent um, and that uh, especially uh, important with youth as they get older and as they're moving towards transition and uh, hopefully towards some level of independence that they need to have their own concerns also uh, become part of the wraparound team and this is again another process where um, they can put strains on collaboration. Sometimes the young person and their family um, do not necessarily agree on exactly uh, what should be the priorities. Um, and in fact, um, in my uh, another project that I'm involved with called the Achieve My Plan Project, we have worked through a very specific uh, technique and set of um, coaching behaviors to uh, teach youth how to participate uh, in meetings in ways that are constructive and that will have an impact on the plan, um, teach them some skills for meeting participation, and um, then also train teams to work with young people and how to hear what the young people are trying to say and to let the young people's views have an impact. So if you want to reach me through our website, I can send you more information about that because we also have a lot of resources and materials um, that provide background and information about, about what uh, exactly kinds of practices can be used for that. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move down to the next person. Uh, we have Dahlia Austin. Did you have a question? Okay, I'm not hearing anything at all. Dahlia, are you out there? I feel like we're doing talk radio here. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to move on down to the next person then. 
Um, we have Sandra Gilbert. Uh, oops. Hello. Hello. Is this Sandra? Yes, it's actually Debbie. We got our, um, she <laughs> sent me the link. I use her, so she's going to listen later. But Okay. Uh, my question is um, about using wraparound services for children that have special health care needs and not just the mental mm -hmm. uh, aspect of it. Have you done any research toward that? Yeah, this is a really common question. Um, we got one in the uh, uh, question queue here that asks about um, youth with uh, substance abuse uh, disorders. Um, special health care needs substance abuse, uh, youth who have been um, found to be delinquent. These are all populations for which wraparound has been applied. Um, but the answer to your question about the research is that um, typically uh, th there's no specific research study that I know of on youth with special health care needs. Some research studies are out there on uh, kids involved in the juvenile justice system. There are some specific uh, research studies on kids in the child welfare system. There are certainly studies on youth with uh, serious emotional behavioral um, disorders. Um, the, the typical answer that I would provide to your question about some of these more, um, these, these other populations is that even within communities, some communities use wraparound as a community operating system that can meet um, a range of needs of kids. So wraparound Milwaukee, you know, this is a care management approach that is receiving, or a care management program that is receiving referrals from juvenile justice, from child welfare, from mental health. Um, in Three Rivers Wraparound here in, in our state, uh, the education system is referring kids to uh, the care management program that is um, uh, implemented using the wraparound approach called Three Rivers Wraparound, as well as the mental health system, as well as the child welfare system. So one answer to, to give is, is that, you know, a community can choose to um, set up a wraparound initiative that may very well be able to meet the, uh, the needs of many different types of youth and families with complex needs. That having been said, the, 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 the greater the variety or range of complex needs that you're attempting to meet in a community, the more you really have to do that system work that Janet was describing to make sure that the uh, services and supports that uh, you know, young people with, for instance, special health care needs might need or community connections that they might need are developed. So I'm not going to say that you, know, you can build a wraparound program and they can immediately serve uh, this great diversity of needs. Uh, uh, you know, across um, all types of needs that kids might have in your in your uh, in your local area, but a lot of times that is the way that uh, local wraparound initiatives function. Uh, but with respect to your basic question of whether there's research on that one population, uh, none that I know of. Thank you. Okay. Oops. So um, I wanted to then just move ahead to a couple more of the questions that we had. Uh, from the uh, question that people typed in, one of the questions, are we at all concerned with hospitalization rates used as measures of success? It appears that service providers are pressured to reduce time or deny hospitalization. I think this um, goes back to one of our um, accountability issues that we have uh, looking at how does a community support wraparound. Well, one of the ways it does is by focusing on a range of meaningful outcomes, um, you know, uh, not just prioritizing necessarily a single one. Of course, we don't want there to never be um, the opportunity to use an out-of-home placement if that's really what's most appropriate. But we do think that it's um, it's very important to collect uh, other other um, outcomes that can tell you if perhaps one of your outcomes is. Uh, looks to be improving, but maybe for the wrong reasons. So if you are also collecting information about whether families feel um, that, they're, that their wraparound plans are being achieved, we think, I think this is one of the crucial wraparound uh, outcomes is, you know, that reflects the, the degree to which those individualized plans are really being achieved um, and getting the outcomes that the families want is how much, how much do they feel that the, that the goals on their plan, plans are being met very rare that you find a family whose goal is to have their kid in the hospital 
uh, most or all of the time. So, you know, what, what is necessary is to be uh, intentional about considering the outcomes that you want and knowing that once you select outcomes, there'll be a kind of a teach to the test um, type of effect coming to where people will be focusing on those. So you want them to focus on, on the range of important outcomes that your stakeholders really um, consider. Yeah, I think the concern typically is that uh, hospitalization is used as a, an option only because the family doesn't perceive that there are any other options or supports mm -hmm. that they can access to keep their kid at home. Now, certainly when there's a well-functioning wraparound team and safety issues are at hand or a need to stabilize a youth, perhaps their medication, their, their symptomatology, um, the availability of, uh, you know, high-quality uh, ho psychiatric hospitalization options is really something that every community should, should have. Um, but the concern is typically more around unnecessary or unwanted hospitalizations as a last resort because other community-based options are not available. That's typically where wraparound is intending to be reducing reliance on hospitalizations, not just uh, because it is um, intended to be something that is eliminated uh, as an assumption from the array of services in the community. There's a few other questions on our uh, message board, perhaps, before we um, conclude that are very interesting and, and really good. I don't see any other hands up, so maybe really quickly try and go through a couple more of these, Janet, and then end. Sure. I'm looking at one right here now that says we use a process called family team conferencing, which sounds a lot like wraparound. Um, are you familiar with this process, and, I'm, and uh, am I correct in assuming that it's wraparound? Um, that is an interesting question. I think um, I... There are many, there are a lot of people that call things child and family teams, group decision making, family team conferencing. They themselves, even within those uh, different designations, don't necessarily all do the same thing. So I think in order, if you want to know if they're, either A, if they think they're doing wraparound, or B, if they really are doing wraparound, you kind of have to find out what they're really doing, find out if they um, have a wraparound model in mind, or compare what they're doing and what they describe their, their practice model, compare it to, say, the National Wraparound Initiative model. Uh, should give a pretty good indication, even if they're doing some kind of wraparound that's just similar, um, you should be able to recognize it by comparing it to the National Wraparound Initiative model. Yeah, and I would just say that, you know, family group conferencing, family team decision making um, are a couple of models that have been, you know, primarily in child welfare for some mm -hmm. time. They really do represent movement towards uh, greater teaming in um, designing plans, greater involvement of uh, uh, families and youth in the process. And, and they are all kind of, they, they, they draw from similar um, recognitions of what is needed to achieve better outcomes. But when you look at them, as Janet was saying, in operation, there tend to be some pretty basic differences. So you may have a team, but it may only meet once, for instance, in family group decision making or family mm -hmm. thing. That's typically different from the wraparound process, which is a more long-term um, process. Um, there's another question here. Outcomes uh, are different, difficult to determine based on outcomes can be subjective. Is there a subjective tool to help determine success of wraparound? This is something that really needs to be determined in each community individually. What are you looking to achieve through implementing a wraparound process? In one community, it may have something to do with maintaining um, young people in homes and communities. In another community, it may be implemented as a way to try and keep them out of trouble, keep them out of um, uh, uh, detention or uh, other secure facilities. Um, in other places, there may be other uh, outcomes that are looking to be achieved. So. For one, one response I would give is, is that every community really should be coming together as a team to ask what is it we're looking to achieve and then to measure whether or not that's being achieved. At an individual family level, I think that we need to be measuring whether or not uh, the family is having its needs met and uh, whether the team is accomplishing its mission. Um, and that requires, um, you know, some pretty systematic approach to supervising RAP facilitators to identify those goals or outcomes and measure them over time. So the last thing I'd say about that is the NWI is in the process of uh, putting together a system that would be available through the same website as our fidelity assessment system to uh, allow teams to enter in uh, core goals for, um, for teams or for youth 
and track that progress over time in a way that they can print out as w for individual teams, as well as aggregate up at a program level to ask, what are the needs or the goals that are being identified in our wraparound initiative, and are we meeting them? So we're working on that, and hopefully we'll have something out to folks uh, to try out, maybe pilot test by the end of this year. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, how do you overcome difficulties in engaging families into the wraparound process? Many families are hesitant to participate due to disappointment um, with current systems. This is obviously a huge problem, um, and one that we think wraparound is actually very uh, well positioned to address. Um, the extensive engagement that's part of wraparound and uh, something that I don't think we actually gave enough attention to was that very typically the staffing pattern of wraparound includes uh, the role of a family partner who is also um, kind of a critical piece of engaging families, especially those who have been disillusioned with their experiences in wraparound so far. Often the family partner will make the initial uh, contact with family and or with a care coordinator. And that family partner is someone who's been through systems, uh, uh, ideally has also experienced wraparound, although not always, and someone who's able to kind of communicate to the family um, how their experience in wraparound should be different from what they've experienced before. Um, but again, then that should be part of, all, of a, a lot of the engagement is, is um, both with the family partner and uh, sometimes there's also uh, now more recently a youth partner involved to help with engagement of, of the young person because even where the family's involved, sometimes the young person does not feel exactly excited about becoming involved with more um, services. So um, again, that there are chapters in the resource guide that you can access uh, under the wraparound support, the essentially the implementation section of the guide that talk about the role of the family partner in the wraparound uh, process, um, again, a very important part for helping families feel, really, that this is something different from what they've had before. And maybe uh, two last, I think we'll be pretty good with covering all the questions if we hit these last two. Does a youth with a diagnosed mental illness need to have stabilized symptoms in order for wraparound to be effective? I assume that means in order for wraparound to, have, to be get started. In order for wraparound to be considered to have been effective for that family. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we're talking about um, that outcome of stabilized symptoms um, being the outcome that is uh, necessarily uh, being held up as evidence for success unless that team has a certain kind of symptom that they've identified as the uh, need that's uh, attempting to be met through pr the process or the goal of wraparound. Again, this is supposed to be an individualized process. A lot of these young people have serious mental health challenges that are not going to be um, remediated easily. Um, you know, we strive to achieve uh, recovery in, in um, any of the young people who are participating, but it very well may not be the goal of the team or, of, or the need expressed by the family to have uh, complete remission of symptoms or even stabilization of cer certain symptoms. So it's, it really d depends on the goal that's um, attempting to be uh, achieved by that team. Um, and then the last question I see here that I think we'll, we'll close on is a good one. Um, will you ever post your live trainings on a public site like YouTube? Um, I think that, um, just a good, good, good thing to close on is that the National Wraparound Initiative, this webinar, um, is kind of, um, and the relaunching of our website, inclusion of a lot more material on that website, um, more availability of national um, trainings and so forth in the future. This is, this is all geared towards being less of a research enterprise as we were the first few years trying to draw upon um, expertise to define uh, the wraparound model a little bit better, and now more towards moving towards a new phase where we are providing um, greater access to materials that will be helpful to the field, um, greater access to more fidelity measures, more trainings, more articles. Um, and I think the answer thus is it's, it sounds like a very good idea to me. We might have it on YouTube. We might have it on our website. But if we feel as though people are benefiting from these real basic orientations to wrap around, then by all means, we should figure out a way to um, maybe have someone a little bit more eloquent than me or Janet, um, 
you know, filmed, giving an orientation to wrap around so that others can have access to it. So I think it's a, a fine idea if people think it would be useful. All right, and with that, I think we've reached the end of the webinar. We want to thank those of you who are still hanging in there uh, for coming, and of course, people who have left, we're glad that you were there too. Um, and say goodbye, and uh, hope that uh, perhaps um, we'll have a chance to either meet some of you in the future, and that uh, you will feel free to be part of future webinars. I also want to just let you know that you will be receiving, um, you'll probably be receiving an, an, a follow-up email with some information in it. Uh, and in the future, probably about six weeks down the line, we'll get back to you asking about the impact that any of the information that you've learned in this webinar might have had on your work or your other activities uh, in your own home environment. So again, thanks, uh, and I think we're done. Yeah, thanks to everyone, and thanks to the TA Partnership for helping facilitate this, and thanks, as always, to the uh, Child, Adolescent, and Family Branch of SAMHSA for supporting the National Wraparound Initiative. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.